time we'll see that video. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's the end of our series today. But it's not the end of God working. He has so much more for us. And this has always been the case as we've moved through series here at Vertical and through the scriptures and adding to our faith and increasing in our faith. God has more for us. It's ahead. I'll tell you later about what's coming. It's even greater than all of this, what God has planned for us. Did you know that when you were born again, heaven was planted in your heart? Eternity came alive in you. And with that, came a desire to see all that is in heaven come to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we have in this, in our spiritual DNA, it is written and engineered into your spiritual being a longing for more than what is happening right here amongst us. You have that within you. A longing to see prayers answered. A longing to see people come to the Lord. A longing for that mountain out in front of you to you to stand on it, to stand in that promise, and to see all that God has come to pass in this life. That is written into your spiritual DNA. You should never dismiss that. You should never deny that. You should never discount that. There should be a, a holy discontent in us. This is, I'm believing God for so much more than what's happening right now. Amen? And that doesn't mean I'm discontent with what's going on right now. It just means I have a vision for God to do more. It doesn't mean I'm ungrateful for what's happening in my life right now. It just means I'm believing that the Spirit of God within me is pulsing for something more. It doesn't mean I'm unhappy with my life right now. It just means that I am passionate and filled with a drive to see the kingdom come to here on earth. And that ought to be a part of all of us. It is a part of us. It is written into your fiber. It is engineered into you. It is part of who you are in Jesus Christ. And if you're not living with that, if you're not agreeing with that, then you're living frustrated. You're frustrated inside because you, you think there should be more, but you won't allow yourself to believe there's more. And the enemy is doing everything he can to keep you from agreeing with God on that deal. Because if he can keep you frustrated with where you are, he'll keep you from trusting God for what's ahead. This is what he's all about. And this is what you and I have been designed with, however, is the same faith that Caleb had that said, God, give me that mountain. It's the same kind of faith that's in Kendall's mom who prays passionately and refuses to give up until he comes to the Lord fully. And how you believe about that vision and passion in you will determine the direction of your life. If you believe it's true and those mountains are out there and that faith is in you and you're passionate for it and your pulse is driven toward it, then you'll live with purpose. But if you believe they're out there but there's too many obstacles, too much opposition, then you will live empty, frustrated, and like the 10 spies in our story, you'll cause yourself, your family, and a nation to just wander aimlessly for the remainder of your life, looking for something to fill the void. It all comes down to what you believe and agree with God on today. As we finish this series, our message is called the power of agreements. Now we have looked at this subject before here at Vertical, but it is important that we understand how this applies in this discussion about believing God has mountains ahead for us. So we're in Joshua 14 today, verses 13 through 15. 
we are at the point in the story where Joshua and the children of Israel and Caleb have entered into the promised land. It has been some 45 years and Caleb has waited. And he has said in the passage we looked at last week in the message, give me that mountain, God. I love what happens in this passage because today they stand inside the promised land ready to take that mountain. Here's what it says. And Joshua, the leader of the nation, blessed him and gave Hebron, that mountain, to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. I love names in the Bible. And wouldn't you love to be the son of Jephunneh? Wouldn't that just be wild, you know? Yeah, my dad, Jephunneh, uh-huh, yeah. So Caleb is the son of Jephunneh. And what's crazy is Caleb, that name here in the Hebrew has this wonderful definition. It means dog. <laughs> How'd you like to have that name? Hey, dog, it's dinner time. <laughs> you know, his name means dog. I don't know what they were thinking about giving him that name. But I do know this. Here is a man who started with the name dog, but here is a man who's about to stand on a promise of God. It doesn't matter where you have been and what you've been called before. When you believe the promises of God, he'll give you a new name and that new name means something. And that new name has promises attached to it. And you can stand on those promises. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you called yourself. It doesn't matter what anybody else called you. You become a child of God with a new name. Amen? Now, in verse 14, it says, Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day. And you're probably thinking, didn't we just read something like that already? Yes. But in verse 13, it said Joshua gave it to him. In verse 14, it said Hebron became the promise inheritance of Caleb. It's one thing to have a promise offered to you. It's quite another to receive it. And just because it's been offered to you doesn't mean you possess it. Just because it's within reach doesn't mean it's in your hands. You have to claim the promise. You have to own it. You have to believe it. You have to possess it. You have to name it. You have to walk in it. You have to apply it. Or it will simply exist as a gift outside your reach. And the danger we face as 21st century Americans in church is that we know a lot about the Bible. But knowing about it doesn't necessarily mean you've owned it in your life. The enemy knows a whole lot of scripture. He knows more than you and I. But just because he knows it doesn't mean he possesses it. Faith possesses it. Faith owns it. Faith claims it. Faith believes it. And here Caleb is possessing the mountain that was given to him. This is an important moment for us to take in here. Here it is. It's big truth. God invites us to make agreements with his promises. This is what Caleb did. He agreed with the promise. Caleb owned it. When you agree with it, then you own it. When you say Yes, God, I believe it. Yes, God, I receive it. It becomes yours. You are in agreement with it. Agreements are important because what you nod your head to is what you become. What you, what you apply in your life is what you become. What you agree with is what you become. For example, when you came to Jesus Christ, you made some agreements with God. You agreed, God. I am a sinner in need of being changed. You agreed with him on that. You agreed with God that Jesus came as the Savior to take away the guilt of your sin. You agreed with him on that. You agreed that that Savior was crucified and rose again on the third day. You agreed with that. You agreed that that gift of eternal life and redemption of your life, the transformation of your life, was for you. You agreed with that, and that's what caused you to be born again. What you agree with is what changes you. Now, in light of that, hopefully, 
hopefully we move on to say, God, I agree that your favor has been given to me as a gift. Grace, God's favor. This is for you and I to agree with. Now, the enemy, he's all the while going to be wanting to stop you from agreeing with any of these things, but especially on this one, that you now have the favor of God in Jesus Christ. And we walk in it. We agree with that. We agree that we have received that by faith and not by my works. We agree that because of that, we are saved and we agree that nothing can snatch us out of the Lord's hand. Those are powerful agreements that we make with him. And they set the course of our life. Now, we continue as we walk by faith and we make other agreements. We begin to agree that he will never leave us or forsake us. We begin to agree that he is working all things together for good. We start to agree that our past, present, and future sins have already been paid for and forgiven and removed from our account. Amen? We start agreeing that I have a new identity. I am not who I was. My new identity is redeemed, transformed, righteous, and blameless in Christ. I didn't say blameless in my performance, but blameless in my identity that God calls me. Amen? That now I have, I agree with, that there are blessings for me in Christ. They are all mine by faith. Every spiritual blessing. I agree with that. I begin to agree that even what the enemy means for evil, God will use for good. I make an agreement with that. I agree that he has prepared me for every good work. And you, I make agreements with these. And to the degree that you agree with these, you start walking in bold faith. You start walking in greater confidence. You stop agreeing with these. You'll find yourself wandering for decades as the children of Israel did. Power of agreements. You agree that spiritual strongholds can be broken in you, in your family's life. You begin to agree that he will make, or he will, he will break generational patterns that are in your family. You begin to agree that you will walk in the light and no longer in the darkness. He has called us to not just pray those things might happen, but to believe by faith they will happen. This is what sets us apart. This is what set Caleb apart from the other spies who went into the land. And Caleb was so convinced of these things that it showed up in his life. It showed up in how he walked. He lifted it up and he lived it out. It's what he did. Because here's what the scripture tells us next in the story. It says, all this became true because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. He lived it out. He went 40 years not seeing the promise yet, but it didn't stop him. He didn't say, I'm checking out on this deal until that promise comes to pass. No, he kept walking in it. He kept believing it, and his behavior proved it. His lifestyle proved it. Because when he turns 80, he's ready to go into the land, and he says, Joshua, I'm as strong today as I was back then. Let's go in and take this land. When you walk out what you agree with, you'll find faith growing in you. Which brings us to our second big point this morning. Your agreements will show up in your life and your children. Now don't let this terrify you. Let this encourage you. Let this build faith in you. Because there are some today who say they believe, but they don't live it out. There are some today who proclaim the gospel and that they believe the word of God, but they don't live it out. There are some who say they know their future is secure, but they live a life of constant worry. There are some today who say, oh, I know God's forgiven me, but they walk in continual guilt and shame. There are some today who say, I know God is with me, but they walk in self-condemnation and rejection. There are some today who say, oh, I know God is working all things together, but they go to bed at night and they cannot turn off their mind. 
Are you hearing me? There are some who say, oh, I know God can heal and redeem and restore, but they walk in continual dis-ease in every part of their life. There are some today who say, oh, I know I am fully accepted in Jesus, but they live needing to have the approval of everybody else around them. There are some today who say, oh, I know I've been freed from my sin, but they walk in constant addiction to substances and food and pornography and work and their own self, and they're proving that they've made agreements with other things other than the truth in their life. You can go to church, you can talk a good game, but what you do in your life proves what you really have made an agreement with. If you're walking in defeat in your life today, I'm afraid you may have made more agreements with the enemy of defeat than the Spirit of God. If you're walking today in fear and anxiety, I'm afraid you may have made more agreements with the giants of fear and anxiety than the Spirit of God. If you're walking today in shame and insecurity, I'm afraid you might have made more agreements with the giants of shame and insecurity and taunting than you have with the Spirit of God. And for this reason, it is imperative that you and I make agreements with God's truth and not the enemy's lies. It plays out in your life and it shows up in your kid's life as well. That shouldn't frighten us. That ought to encourage us. If we were to read ahead in the story of Joshua and Caleb, there's this fascinating piece where they get on into the land and Caleb has a daughter and Caleb's daughter gets married and Caleb is showing her and her future husband the land that they are going to have because Caleb is doing for his children what God did for him. God gave him a land, and so Caleb is giving them a parcel of land. But watch how this plays out. Because his daughter, they're riding along, and the Bible says she got off her donkey, and she stopped and said, Dad, I know you're giving us this land. This is awesome. Thank you so much. I'm paraphrasing. But could I also have the springs on the north end and the springs on the south end as well? And you might think, You selfish little girl. I just gave you this whole parcel of land and you're asking for springs too? But Caleb recognizes, oh, this is faith. This is faith right here that believed just like I did that my father in heaven loves me, that my father has plans for me, that my father has a land for me. And so when she says, dad, can I have those springs too? He said, Sure you can. I'd be happy to give those to you. Because he was doing what God was doing for him. And he was watching his daughter do the same thing that he had done with God. It will show up in your life when you make agreements with God. And that's a good thing. Amen? It will be the blessing that moves on to your children and their children and their children because the agreements that you make have a lasting impact, not just in your life, but beyond that. Back to the story. It says that this place, the name and the name of Hebron, this mountain, formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Now, this is one of those verses that you think, that's a lot of names that I don't use and I don't understand. I'm going to get on to the next verse. But this is worth stopping at. This is worth getting out of the car for. This is worth looking at deeply here. Because this is the mountain that God was giving Caleb. And we saw last week, it was named Hebron. That's important. But here in this verse, it says that mountain did not always have that name. That mountain had another name previously. Formerly, it was Kirjath Arba. And it tells us in parentheses, Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Who were the Anakim? They were the giants. And the scripture had given us three names of the giants. And this man, Arba, 
was their father. This man was the man who began the race of the giants. This man was evil. This man was wicked. This man was opposed to the ways of God. This man wanted to stop the children of Israel from coming into the land. This man did not want to give up his mountain. This man had claimed this mountain for himself. This man was wickedly and vitally opposed to the people of God. But this mountain that belonged to Caleb once had that evil giant's name on it. But what I love is that Caleb never called it Kirjath Arba. He never looked at what it was in his future and said, that's the land of the giant. That is the place of torment. That is the place of impossibility. Caleb never called his future by evil. Caleb called his future instead Hebron, this mountain, the blessed promised land. He called it the place flowing with milk and honey. He called it the place God had given us. He called it the place they would overcome. He never agreed with the giant that the land belonged to him. It's important what you say about your future. It's important what you name it. It's important what you say about it. If God's given you promises for your future, for your children's future, for your family's future, for your grandchildren's future, don't ever, ever let the voice of the enemy tell you it's not. Don't ever let him give you the name for that future. Don't ever let the enemy tell you, oh, your future, impossible, miserable, not going to happen, a mess, terrible, wickedness, problems. Don't ever agree with the enemy. Those 10 men who went in as spies, that's exactly what they did. They heard the taunting of the enemy. They heard the lies of the enemy. They heard all the threats and they agreed and said, you're right, you're right. We're just mere grasshoppers in your sight. You're bigger, you're more powerful, you're stronger, you're more evil, you're the worst. We agree, we'll run. What you agree with will determine the next steps in your life. Refuse to ever make agreements with the giants. Now, I want to expose his plot here this morning and tell you some of the things that the enemy wants you to agree with. So get ready. I don't have it on screen. I'm just going to talk it. I'm going to tell you. The enemy cannot take anything from your life as a child of God. You are in the hands of Jesus. He is working all things together for your good in your life. But know this, the enemy wants to stop that from happening. He can't stop God from doing it. But what he can do is he can begin to whisper subtle deceptions to you and me. And he'll do it in such a way that you and I will begin to make agreements with him. And for every step that you take in agreement with him, you are opening the door for him to have a place in your life. And agreement after agreement after agreement. And once that happens, it's almost as though the enemy can say, my work here is done. Because the Christian who agrees with the enemy will self-destruct all on their own. They'll wreck their lives and he'll never have to lift a finger. Here are some statements that the enemy wants you to agree with. I am still a sinner and failing miserably. Seems like an easy statement to agree with. 
But the minute you agree with the enemy that you're still a sinner and not a redeemed saint, you have been caught. Because now you have just denied the power of the gospel to transform your life. And you were nothing more than you ever were. Subtle. Another statement he'll make, he wants you to agree with. I'm such a disappointment to God. Subtle. Deceptive. I am such a failure. I will never know real victory. I'll never be happy. I'll never be free. I'll always be a slave to my appetites. I'll never defeat the giants. God really won't come through. I'm too small, too insignificant, too weak. God blesses others, but not me. My past keeps me from being blessed. I am my dysfunction. I deserve all that has happened to me. The abuse is my fault. The pain is my fault. I will never change. Every one of those statements has just enough credibility to it to make you and I just nod at it. Yeah? Seems right. Seems true. But every one of them are devoid of the power of the gospel and the truth of what you have been made in Jesus Christ. And for this reason, the enemy is having his way in the church and in our nation and our world this day. Because believers are not equipped enough with the truth to be able to thin all of those off and they just agree and agree and agree and pretty soon they are powerless, they are impotent, they have no faith, they have no future mountain they're holding to and they are slaves to every one of his lies. Let me tell you the impact of this. This is not just this generation. This has been happening for a little while. But boy, it is seen in this generation. So the group that you may have heard of called Gen Z, Generation Z, that were born in the mid-1990s up through 2010, 2011, that group right there, they are the segment of population least interested in church today most distrusting of church today. And when I heard this next one, I was just shocked. 20% of the Generation Z identifies in some way as LGBTQIA2S+. 20%. That's a lot. Because they have been made to believe that they are their urges. They are their appetites. And if they feel it, they are it. And for this reason, it is all the more imperative that you and I, as believers, know the lies of the enemy and be able to shut them down when they start being whispered to us. Because once you agree with any one of those statements and so many others that the enemy makes, once you make an agreement with them, you will, on your own, without any other help from the enemy, you will automatically become more angry, more bitter, 
more controlling, more isolated, more anxious, more fearful, more doubting, more self-serving, more pleasure-seeking, more addicted, more self-destructive. It happens on your own and the enemy just laughs and said, my work here is done. Don't ever make agreements with giants. But instead, boldly make agreement with God for miracles. Now, let's camp out here a minute. Because this is where the power is. This is where the punch is. God has given us his word. And we, as his children, know that word, hear that word, believe that word. Amen? And we are called to be in agreement with that word. Even when it doesn't fit my emotions or feelings at the time. I, I submit myself to what he says. And if somehow what he says doesn't fit what I'm feeling, I change my feelings to fit what he said. Not the other way around. I don't change God's word to fit the culture, my feelings, my urges, my appetites. I believe his word, even if it is telling me something that to me seems impossible and miraculous. But this is exactly what Noah did. Noah made an agreement with God that judgment was coming and an ark was needed. And he built that ark and his family was saved because he made an agreement with God about something miraculous. Abraham and Sarah made an agreement with God about something miraculous he promised that they thought there's no way that can happen. We can't have children at our age. But they believed the miraculous, made an agreement with it, and a child was born. Moses and the children of Israel made an agreement with God that putting the blood on the doorpost would save their children from the death angel that would pass over. And sure enough, it did. Their babies were kept alive. We are called to make agreements with the miraculous. As you heard the story here several weeks ago with Didi and Wes Rainey, Didi made an agreement with God about a promise that her husband would come home. And God kept his word and his promise and something miraculous happened. We saw the story. You heard it with Kendall this morning. Kendall's mother agreed with God about a promise and the miraculous happened. Now this is where it gets tough for you and I as believers because we don't mind agreeing with God's word in general and God's truth revealed to us. But believing for some things miraculous in our life like a wayward husband being turned back to the Lord or my family being reconciled or that loved one who has been gone 10 years and just keeps going further and further away from the Lord, believing that that could somehow be miraculously turned around. That's the stuff where a lot of us, after a little bit of time, after a little bit of pressure and a little bit of opposition, just say, ah, I guess this is just not going to happen. And we stop agreeing with God. We stop agreeing for the miraculous. But that's what Caleb never stopped doing. He never stopped agreeing for the miracle that they would enter the land, that he would have his parcel, and he would stand on that mountain. So I've been challenged by this. So this weekend, Heather and I took some time, went out, and we talked and prayed through. What are some things that we are believing for miracles to happen. It's a difficult conversation because it's very personal. It involved things in our own lives and right around us. And so we talked and put down in writing 10 miracles that we are believing God for. I'm not going to tell you what they are because they're ultra private to us and personal for us. But every one of them are not just, I'm just praying for this family member. No, here is specifically what we are praying in this situation. Here is the outright miraculous that we are believing God for. 
that'll challenge your faith to say, okay, God, I'm going to take this whole give me this mountain thing to heart. I'm going to put it into practice. I'm going to put it in writing. So I would encourage each of us, challenge us, let's get to that kind of faith where we are making agreements with God about some specific miracles happening in your sphere of influence, your life, your family, your church, your community. God, what do you have that you want to do that is so much bigger than what I can normally do? I want to believe you for that. This is exactly what faith is, you realize. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that faith is the certainty of things hoped for a proof of things not seen. For by it, the people of God, or people of old, gained approval. God loves it when you believe him for the miraculous. God loves it. He's drawn to it. He is like magnetic power drawn to whoever says, God, I'm gonna believe you for something miraculous. He's like, let me get over there as quick as I can. I wanna be there. I wanna get into that moment right there. If you believe me, I wanna show myself strong. I don't wanna miss out on that. I don't wanna be the guy who's believing in the maybe, the possibly, the will sees. I wanna be the guy who says, God, I believe your word. I believe it so much that I'm writing down this promise. I'm writing down this miracle and I'm holding to it. I don't care what happens. I don't care which way life goes. I don't care which way they go. I don't care which way the circumstances go. I'm still believing you for this miracle. I want that mountain. Amen? Back to our story. Because Caleb did this, because Caleb believed God, because he refused to ever identify with what the enemy said, because he only wanted to identify with what God said about him, here's what it says in verse 15. Then the land had rest from war. They entered in. They slayed the giants. And man, rest came. They began to be at ease. He gave his daughter some land and they took possession of all that God had promised. I thank God in this day, there's so much happening. There are giants who are at work and they're trying to fill us, even as believers, with fear and doubt and shame and guilt and accusations and pressure and impossibilities and comparison. And all that stuff can create a war inside. It can keep you awake at night. It can keep your heart beating a whole lot faster than it needs to. It can keep you from being at peace. It can keep you from seeing with faith. But if you'll believe God and agree with him, don't agree with the enemy then rest can come to your land. It can come rest to your spirit, rest to your mind, rest to your emotions. It can bring rest into your family. It can bring rest into a community. And this is what we are believing God for. Amen? No more agreements with the enemy. Only agreements with God. So I want to close with this together. And I'm going to ask you to repeat after me as a way of us making agreement with God this morning. Repeat after me. I am a child of God. I am what he says I am. I will not be intimidated I will not be threatened by giants. I will walk in God's promises. I will identify with my miracles. And I will slay giants. Because I want that mountain. Come on. This is who we are as God's people. Let's agree to nothing less. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we stand in your truth today. We stand against the lies, the deceptions, the threats 
the assault of the giants in our land today. We will not be taken off guard by them. We will not be deceived by them and we will make no agreement with their lies. We will only make agreement with your truth and with who we are in you, Jesus. So Father, fill us with faith. Fill us with hope. And God, for each family in here, for each marriage, for each individual, God, give them that mountain that they hold to. Give them that promise that they wait for. Give them that miracle. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.